Okay. Yeah, so I guess uh, from my perspective, although the context has changed, I think evidence based has always been important and it's now more important than ever. Um, and I think we're, one of the things that we've definitely found is that there's a real, uh, I guess, thirst or hunger for what's the, the dominant trend or what's the dominant pattern, what must we do to resolve the problems that we're encountering through COVID. And, because of the variance based, you know, in terms of we had, we, there are some industries where, you know, aviation, you know, or oil, where we're really tanking, you know, we're losing staff, we can't afford to do what needs to be done. Then there's other industries that are booming. Um, so the, the, where this divide is really increasing, the, the, the challenges that we now face sort of mean that just the, the Hawthorne effect or the placebo effect of rocking up and doing something just isn't going to have the effect that it used to. Um, because there is this sense of everybody's building new habits, new ways of work. We're all tired, um, no matter where you are, in, in terms of what you're doing. Um, there's a large segment of the population that are having much more difficulties at home as well. Now, this is not a research-founded statement, you know, but in talking to colleagues in the counselling field, where their dominant finding is more of that sense of, it's not as if people are developing new challenges, but the inability to cope with the existing ones, you know, and so because of that, the evidence-based practices are really critical, you know, and when we, that's where I think as practitioners in the field, the, the kind of two-edged sword of that is that we've always said everything that we do must be evidence-based, but I think the best practitioners will also say, but we're tracking that what we intended it to do is actually, it's doing what we said it would. And I think that's where the credibility aspect comes in, that there's the courage, and I think as a consultant, you know, I've got to, as a consultant who, happens, who is a psychologist, you know, from that sense of integrity, you've got to be able to put your hand up where we might be doing something and it's not working. Um, here's the measure or the input or the feedback or the, uh, the, the outcome that's contributing to that result. What are we going to uh, start to do differently? And that's where I kind of see that, that I think the scientist practitioner model where we're kind of looking at well, what is the evidence based on what we did, whether it's the, I think the things that we've, I mean, Alex Perez in the audience who brings a lot of our intel into the team, whether it's the job characteristics model, you know, or the Burke Litwin, I know that was one, you know, there's lots of these foundational, <laughs> you know, frameworks that are bloody brilliant, you know, um, you know, that can just give you a boost above anything else that you might read in opinion-based blogs, you know, or articles that we've just got such uh, brilliant sort of access to as psychologists. And then having the mechanisms that can be really hard to track, I guess, impact, because some consultants don't want to share their safety data. Some consultants don't want to share their grievances, but, you know, or HR data in that respect, but where, they, where you can build that trust and relationship, you kind of partner with them to, to build the plane in the sky a little bit. Um, but starting from evidence base is key. Um, so, the, for the academics in the room, this won't be an unfamiliar story, but it seems that every major journal has had a COVID-specific special issue um, in the last six months. And, you know, just this month, JAP's had one, J Journal of Applied Psychology and Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. Um, and I think the editorial at the beginning of the Occupational Health Psychology special issue was really good, written by Mindy Schoss, saying... Um, Basically, everything, every stressor that's in the pages of the JOHP has been front and centre in the pandemic, absolutely core to these issues. The evidence base, the theories and the tools are exactly um, what the, what's been important and has been critical in helping organisations deal with the problems. Um, but the, the pandemic's given us heaps of opportunity to explore boundary conditions for these theories that we would never have been able to you know, have real life experimental data about people being forced to work from home against their will or various other things. But um, so great opportunities, the, the theories hold still, still hold, I totally agree. You know, there's social identity theory, um, self-determination theory, I'm looking, I'm looking at the various experts who, you know, theory plan, there's all the, all the giants in, you know, JDR, these theories, 
have held true and still hold true. But there's, there is great opportunities and there's heaps of great interesting new questions that have arise, have arisen from this as well. I, I probably got to think a bit harder about this one. I don't, my first thought, and I could probably argue it both ways if I'm honest, is that yes, it's still valid and it doesn't change much. Um, I think it's what COVID has done again has really just heightened some of what we know is probably already important or has always been important to teams or to what teams expect of their leaders or to what organisations of, expect of their leaders and teams. And a good example of that is belonging um, and meaning. We know, especially from our team, more, what, our care, what our team care more and more about is having a sense of connection um, and purpose to what they do and what they're connected to in the business um, and belonging, feeling like they're part of a team. And it, you know, I, I, I spoke quite a lot previously around what this has meant for our frontline team. But equally, we've got a um, really massive support office of, I don't know, probably 5,000 plus people. And it has really been a tale of two halves in that sense. We, we've, we've had similar themes around meaning and belonging for both. Support team who are at home, who are taking care of their kids, doing homeschooling, still having to work, learning how to run a massive meeting and facilitate a workshop virtually with technology that they've never used before, like jam boards and all of those things. Um, and then you've got team in store who still equally care about connection and just want to know that when my leader walks past me, they're going to acknowledge me and say hi and ask how I'm going today. So that's kind of the argument on, yes, I think what we know is intrinsically important um, to creating a really safe, great, um, high performance business or team culture, it's still the same. The only thing I would say is we probably don't talk about it enough. And it, goes to what you said before, Alex, you know, how do we get some of the research out there? How do we share it in a way that actually makes sense um, in really practical terms? And some of us, you know, I know lots of people in this room do that really well, um, but I think the more we do that, the better to counter where there are those narratives that probably aren't as empirically valid as they could be. And wellbeing is a good example of it. Um, I think what's great about the rise of teams and people calling out for wanting more support from their employer on mental health is that they're talking about it though. Um, and if that means they're gonna go and find research for themselves and have a conversation with their teammates about it, what they learnt or the app that they downloaded to learn how to do some deep breathing in between meetings, like I, I personally think that's fantastic. Um, but you know, the more that the professionals share and lead the way, the better. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I, I, I would just concur with most of the views here. I mean, I, I think one of the th big messages of the pandemic is that it's a great kind of divider, you know, and it creates kind of inequality. And I think it does that in a science too. So, I think if you had a crap theory, it probably hasn't done very well, you know. So, but if you have a good theory, well, it's probably done pretty well. And I think that's really so. It has, it has done a bit of a sort job there. What I would say is that I think the sorts of things that we talk about, like social identity and connectedness and, and the group and the importance of team dynamics. I think for a lot of people that was all a bit peripheral to organisational psychology, but I think I think it has done, it's like, you know, it's demonstrated this is front and centre and the thing. And, and again, the, the sort of leadership piece around that, that that needs to be a focus for your energies as a leader rather than just your leader identity and something about your, you know, the, the way you give a talk or whatever it might be. I think I think that, I think it's, 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 it's focused people's energies in particular uh, kind of ways. And I think, it, yeah, and it has created created an appetite I think there's I think there's I don't think I don't think anybody in this room is going to be short of work for a very long time which is both a good and a bad thing yeah so um just going on what you said uh Kirsten that the um the COVID special issue uh, discussion about all the stresses that have been identified and all the research are all coming to fruition and and they all exist now so that's kind of from stressor perspective, but I was also look, thinking about this from a, um, a, a turnover, a staff turnover, and why people are leaving and whether people want to leave kind of perspective. And if you go back and look at all the research on what's associated with whether people want to leave, a lot of those factors that, that, that come out in the meta-analysis and all the research, um, things like you know, whether people are coping, for example, and so there's a negative relationship between coping 
um, and whether people intend to leave the organisation, whether people are committed to things outside the organisation, whether people are committed to the organisation, um, whether people get support from their supervisor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these things that are found in the research as being really important correlates with intention to leave, they'll all still exist now and be completely relevant. And actually, if you take all of those those factors that have, uh, are associated with intention to leave and you identify them and you go, okay, is that going to be relevant in the pandemic? Yes. Is that going to be relevant in the last year? Oh, very much so. Is coping an issue? Oh, yes, et cetera, et cetera. So the research that we have, you know, been identifying as academics over the years is very much kind of relevant for now. But actually, the, the conditions are suddenly existing where with intention to leave, for example, people are thinking about leaving quite a lot of, uh, of their job which kind of comes back to something else that has been coming out in the, in, in the HR field um, in, in the last, in fact, the last few months, something called the big quit or um, the great resignation. So in the US, for example, and so if you actually look at the research on, there's a big discussion that people are quitting their jobs more than any time before because of the COVID and the lockdown and, and, and their experiences in their organizations in that context. If you actually try and understand where that, that narrative is coming from about the great resignation and having a look at resignation levels uh, in different countries is really quite interesting. So in the US, for example, in June and July, they had the highest quit rates that they've had for 20 years um, across the, like 4 million people resigned in, in July, for example. And, and so there's a big discussion about that's as a response to the COVID and how, what everybody's experiencing. It's not quite hit Australia. If you look at the, mo the, the labour mobility statistics in the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, that's not the case yet in Australia. But there's a big discussion that, that we're expecting that to happen, and similarly in the UK as well. So whether or not, because we're a bit behind in COVID <laughs> and our experiences of lockdowns, et cetera, whether that's going to happen or not, it's going to be quite interesting going forward. And I'm sure Alex has got something to say about that. Um, so that's just kind of one really interesting reflection in terms of what the research shows about why people leave their jobs. And um, so that's interesting. And so some of the research has been showing, well, I'm not sure how good the research is. It's often driven by companies like Gallup, who are, who are big workforce engagement surveys. So they, they're kind of, uh, uh, they have a vested interest in discussing these issues, but they argue that, you know, actually this is a real engagement problem that, that, that everyone's going through post um, post-pandemic but um, anyway but, but from a evidence-based practice perspective as well one of the things looking at it from an HR analytics perspective um, many organizations obviously in this space in terms of HR analytics are trying to do attrition modeling and trying to do identify predictors of why people leave organizations their own organizations so that they could potentially do some profiling of their workforce to try to identify are there certain pockets of our workforce who we need to pay more attention to to try to make sure they don't leave? And that's an activity that many HR analytics from, uh, teams are, are doing. What's quite interesting, though, is that those models will be based on many years of data that you need to go back to identify who's leaving from where generally in a stable environment. So obviously what we've been experiencing in the last year or so is, is not a stable environment. It's very different. So it's going to be very interesting in terms of those companies who are using those attrition models and trying to identify predictors of turnover, whether or not that data actually holds up and whether those models actually work in the current context. So that's going to be quite interesting going forward in terms of those companies that use those kind of models and activities. So I guess, um, that's probably all I could say more, but probably, probably I should hand up. You so you, you've all got me thinking. The only thing I would say is I do think that what technology has done and switching to remote working, what's on my mind is probably it has definitely accelerated as well the role of teams leading themselves so that that concept of the team leading and not just one individual again that's not new um, but it has amplified 
the value and the importance of that. And I don't know how much, you know, if I think, and I'm, you know, I think really crude, I'm not, not a good org psych, I don't stay as on top of new research as I should, um, thus the benefit in talking about it more, right, and sharing, but I, I kind of would go, well, what should I be looking at right now to leverage that? I'm sure there's things, but how do we talk more about it? Because how does, this, how does someone communicate really effectively virtually um, when you can't read body cues, um, particularly if people are wearing masks, right? Makes it even harder to understand how's that person actually feeling right now, if it's a difficult conversation or I've got to influence them. I think there's some of those nuances in the world of work and how people interact and make decisions. That's probably where I just say, I don't know if it challenges current evidence, but is there an opportunity to, to amplify some of what we know or what we've seen? I actually think that's a really, really important point and one of the things we definitely need to update. Um, one of the few studies, I think I was talking to someone about this over there before, one of the few studies I've actually seen that's properly measured Zoom fatigue um, and the, you know, camera on versus camera off and the performative aspect of it and, and that it does have these consequences for exhaustion and also voice and engagement. So if people have got their camera on, they're less likely to engage in meetings and have as much voice. Um, and it impacts women more than men and it impacts new starters more than old starter, uh, people with longer tenure. I think these are the kinds of things we don't know. How do, how do we create liminal spaces between meetings where we used to have that authentic connection after a meeting or, you know, we could check in and say, oh, what do you think about so-and-so? He was a bit of a, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, not, not gossip, but, but some the authentic human connection that we're missing out on. That you, at Currently, technology... You have to proactively, in a really clunky, cardboard kind of way, create these opportunities for connectedness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to update, the, how the technology can catch up with what we need in that space. You look like you want to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna, <laughs> so just a bit there, and I think, again, it relates to the stuff that we've been doing, is I think when we talk about leadership development, traditionally that's been really focused just at the upper echelons of an organisation. I think what we know from our research is that, you know, effective teams have always been leaderful, and I think you have to understand that leadership is an activity everybody needs to be engaging in, and then you need to have programmes that are really for everybody, and so it's an equal, you know, it's, a, it's an equal access kind of thing, um, because, uh, because I, think, I think it was always a bit of a problem, that model, but again, in, you, teams are are going to be effective again the group is a solution so everybody in the team needs to be tooled up and powered to do that and I think finding ways through that and, and providing the infrastructure support to support that is absolutely going to be critical um, and, and but there's a huge appetite for that in organizations too all the people that we're uh, talking with that's the, the that's absolutely the number one issue and there's they have all kinds of anxieties about about disengagement and just losing in just organizations just slipping off the end you know the end of the of the conveyor belt as it were were. Um, and, I, and I think, um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think that, that that again is pretty transformational. I think the other thing, and this was something you talked about before, was that at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of people kind of rebundling, repackaging the stuff that they used to do face to face, and just putting it online and saying, "Oh, look, here they've got this great program." All of that stuff fell over very quickly. A lot of they were not fit for purpose, so you had to do a lot of redesigning again from the ground up. Um, and I think again. Uh, you know, the more that was informed by good theory and good insights, the better that has been. But I think it has exposed some, you know, some of the snake oil that was kind of out there to kind of too. And I think, again, that, that actually helping people to navigate that terrain and say, no, you, you want to be going, you know, to, in this direction and towards this body of knowledge is, is and the signposting bit there is, is a critical leadership function for all of us, you know, in, then. Yeah, and massive appetite for that. 